And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Almighty fortress, you go before us, nothing can stand against the power of our God, you shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you.
Father's will. You have chosen me. Your love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child longer I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. You split the sea. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Yes, I am a child. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. God. Father, we thank you that you have given us this great privilege that we can be called your children, that we can be called daughters of the Most High God. And Lord, today we we know that you have something important and special to speak to us today, so would you open our minds and our hearts and our our spiritual eyes to see what you have for us this morning. Um, So God, we give you the glory this morning, and we pray, pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Am I good? Am I? Oh, yeah. It's it's on. Um, Turn with me to Romans chapter 8, please. Um, Let's see. Announcements. We are, you probably noticed that your homework ends after next week. So we had done it in two different sessions. So we, um, you actually do have to sign up if you're going to do session number two with us, but by popular demand, we are keeping small groups the same, okay? So small groups will stay the same, but we are open for new people coming, and uh, they'll just, we'll, so we might have some new um, people in our groups, but small groups will be staying the same. Also, the T, the cutoff, the deadline is this Sunday, which is Easter Sunday, so if you aren't signed up, Please get signed up. It's really going to be a sweet morning. It's two hours. It's going to be a great message by Yanni Hint from Calvary Houston in Friendswood. 
Um, so get signed up. Um, time is ticking. So uh, and I think that's it for announcements. Yes. Okay. So we are in the um, uh, path of looking at um, Romans 8 from verses 1 through to 17. Um, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you so grateful that we can come to you as our Abba Father, Lord, as our dad, as um, this relationship that we have and how sweet, even as we sung, Lord, to consider that we are a child of God, that we are yours, that we belong to you, Lord. And so I pray that you would speak to us, Lord, that you would open up the eyes of our understanding um, into your word, that you would help us uh, navigate your word by your Holy Spirit, and that you would help me, Lord, to communicate only what is from you. And so please be the divine editor of my words. In Jesus' name, amen. So last chapter, um, Paul referred to himself over and over again in the first person. It was like 40 times, over 40 times. And then he came to the point where he said, do you remember, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this, this body of flesh? And then, of course, we know there was an answer to it, like Jesus will deliver me. This chapter, it is the Holy Spirit that is mentioned over and over and over, 19 times, 19 references to the Holy Spirit. Um, Romans 8.1 will begin with this beautiful declaration that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And then at the end of chapter 8, it will end with there is no separation from the love of Christ. Nothing can separate us. So there's, it's beautiful bookends to this chapter. There's no condemnation for us in Christ, and neither will there ever be any separation from Christ. So let's get into the, the word. Um, there is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So this condemnation is found, no condemnation is found because of our position. Our position is in Christ. Four times we'll read this, that we are in Christ, right? And so how can there be no condemnation? And it is a strong word, this word condemnation. It means actual punishment following condemnation. It's because Jesus already took all of it for us. Right? He took all of our punishment and our judgment and our condemnation, and now we are in him. And we'd already read that because we're in him, we are justified, just as if I'd never sinned, right? And that God has reckoned us righteous. He put righteousness into our account. Was it earned? It is a gift of grace, right? By faith. We just believe in him, and, and that's accounted to us. So this no condemnation, again, it should give us a collective sigh of relief. It should feel good. That, that, that's our position of no condemnation. I am safe. I am secure. I am safe. And then he says, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You may have, if, if you read somewhere in a commentary, so some good commentators say that is not in some original manuscripts, and they say, they, they leave it out. Come talk to me later. You can come talk to me. And we'll, I'm, I'm just not going to get into it, even though I have all these notes on it. But anyways, so what is Paul saying? He's saying at those that walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh, right? My life is now directed or oriented in a new way, right? Once, once I'm in Christ, I'm born again. My life is now oriented in a new direction, directed by the Holy Spirit, and I'm learning to walk in a newness of life. We read that in chapter 6, that we walk now in a newness of life. In chapter 7, we read that we are to um, walk in the newness of the Spirit. Twice we read this newness of life. I was saved in Romans chapter 12. I don't know if I, if I shared that maybe at the beginning of this study. I was saved in Romans chapter 12, a Bible study. And the guy got up and he said, you know, every morning, you know, Romans chapter says like, I, you know, um, oh, goodness, uh, you know the verse. It's, I, I give myself over, what is it? 
offer yourself a living sacrifice. Wow. Okay, offer your, and so the guy gets up and literally he's like, every morning I offer myself a living sacrifice. Mind you, imagine the most carnal girl you could get, the most worldly girl you can get. And it is truly the power of God, right? It's the gospel because it doesn't need to be seeker sensitive because that message was really strong. And I was like, I was converted in my heart during the Bible study. If I had checked a thing, if, you know, if I was filling out a form and it said, what is your religion? I would have checked Christian. But I sat through that Bible study and the Lord opened my eyes and I realized I don't know Jesus. And I got to know Jesus and I was converted. I didn't even know you had to say a prayer. But I know I was saved and I was born again in that Bible study. And my whole life now was oriented a different direction. I took home a Bible from that Bible study. It was the New Believers Bible. It has all of Greg Laurie's notes. And later I would start doing the Bible study. I'd be like, it had the beginning, who is God? And then I would go, who is God? Right in my journal, who's God? And I'd look up all the, but before I even started my study in the Bible, I remember going to the gym the next day and being on a stair climber and, 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 and with the Holy Spirit saying, you shouldn't dress like that. I'm like, oh, yeah, I did I mean, I was like awake. I was, my life was now oriented by the Spirit, right? I remember the Lord saying, you shouldn't act like that. And, and before, I mean, I had to be, I mean, we won't grow without the Word, but be, even before that, the Lord was working, right? To walk means to behave or how we conduct ourselves or how we live. And so we walk according to. According means to flow from. Or it means to um, all that is consistent with the source. So what is consistent with the source? When we're born again and we have the spirit of God living in us, right? My life is now oriented from that source. I am to walk after the spirit. Verse 2. I'm going to read 2 through 4. <clears throat> for the law of the spirit of Christ, uh, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was it was weak through the flesh god did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit I don't know what, I feel like a boy going through puberty. My voice keeps doing this weird thing. I'm like, what is going, what kind of frog is in my throat? So just bear with me. Um, so there is always this contrast that we see. The spirit equals life, right? Sin equals death. Every single time, right? You can't change it. That's just what, spirit equals life, sin equals death, Right? And he says there's this new law working in us, right? This law is not like a written law. It's more like a principle, like the law of gravity, right? It, it, it's like you can't, it's this law is working, this principle, this law of Christ is working in me. Like God said to Jeremiah, I will make a new covenant with the people, right? Uh, no longer written on tablets of stone, but I will write them on the fleshly tablets of their heart. So this law that's working in me is written in my heart, right, by the Lord. And so what the law, verse 3, what the law couldn't do, Paul is talking about there, the Mosaic law, what it couldn't do, which he earlier said is just and holy, right? It's good. But what it couldn't do is change me, right? All it could do was what? Reveal how holy God is and how unholy I am and show me the weakness of my flesh. I just can't it couldn't change me there's over 600 laws can you imagine trying to keep them you just like just when you feel you get good you're like oh wait right that's why the sacrificial system had to be in place because you couldn't couldn't keep them and it all pointed to jesus so he says in verse 4 the requirement of the law it is not fulfilled by us but fulfilled in us right? It's fulfilled in us by Jesus Christ because Jesus came, it says, in the likeness of sinful flesh. He's the only one who could fulfill the law perfectly. He took our condemnation. So now our standing 
our right standing is because of him. And so again, we walk, he says, according to, or remember, it is, it is from the source, right? We walk according. Our manner of life is the spirit of God. Verse five, for those who live <clears throat> according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So we have a contrast here. Those who are saved, clearly, those who are saved and those who are not saved, those who are his and those who are not his, those who live according to the flesh, and those who live according to the spirit. Those who are carnally minded and those who are spiritually minded. Those who are alive and well in Jesus Christ and those who are the walking dead in their sin and trespasses. In verse 5 it says, Before we were saved, we lived after the flesh. We set our minds on things of the flesh. And he says the carnal mind is death. The carnal mind is enmity um, or hatred, right? It, and and. Ephesians 2 gives us such a good picture of our before. We talked a little bit about it. It it's gives such a good um, where we were before Christ, right? We were spiritually dead. We were walking according to the course of this world. According to, and, and who leads that, that course of the world? The prince of the power of the air, right? And so, but he made you alive, it says. And, and we read that and go, yeah, that was us before. And every person who is not saved is in that condition currently, right? It's kind of an eye-opener. That's their condition, right? And so the carnal mind, Jesus talks about um, the carnal mind in Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount in verse 25. And you can jot it down or you can go there, but I'm going to read it. He says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. And what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you'll put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your who? Heavenly Father. He feeds them. Are you of not much more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to a stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies. He talks about them, right? They're, no, nothing has does it more beautiful clothes than them. Now, God, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you of little faith? And then in verse 31, he says, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? And he says, For after all these things the Gentiles seek. That is the carnal mind, right? It's all about what am I going to do? What is, it's all right here on this plane. That's the carnal mind. How am I going to please myself? How am I going to make myself happy? What am I going to do? What am I going to wear? What am I going to do? But he says, your heavenly father knows that you have need of all these things. And then he talks about the spiritually minded. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And it's so sweet in there too because we're considering God as our father. And he's not saying, why are you worried about that? He's saying, don't worry about it. Let me worry about it. Isn't that precious? It's so sweet. So this, so we have this carnal man. We have the spiritual man. The spiritual man, he says in verse 9 and verse 10 and verse 11 that the spirit of God dwells in you. Christ is in you. If you are born again, Christ is in you. And no man can be saved unless he's born again. John chapter 3, like, right? You can't see the kingdom of heaven unless a man is born again. And that man lives according to the Spirit. In verse 11, 
He says, the spirit of him who raised uh, Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Spirit, capital S. When we see spirit, capital S, who is that talking about? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. Um, I think we looked at uh, John 14, and there's so much we can look at regarding the Holy Spirit. But Jesus gives that promise of the Holy Spirit in John 14. In verse 15, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father. He will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. He wasn't in them yet, right? Because Jesus hadn't, hasn't hadn't res- been resurrected. But once Jesus was resurrected, he will say to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And they will be born again. And the, the Holy Spirit will be in them. If you go down to verse 25, he says, these things I've spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring, rem- bring remembrance all things I said, right? And so we have this Holy Spirit. That's why the orientation of our life is now according to the Spirit. It's going that way. It can't not go that way if the Holy Spirit is in us. Three times, he's dwelling in you, he's dwelling in you, he's dwelling in you. And Ephesians um, 1, and we talked about it sometime earlier in this study. You know, Paul prays that we would know the power, that you would know the power available to you that power that raised jesus from the dead that's that holy spirit power right and so this contrast we see there's the carnally minded and the spiritually minded carnally minded to be carnally minded means i am mindful of the appetites and impulses of my flesh my thoughts are all directed at what pleases me right it's all right here it's doing what is right in my own eyes it means I'm emotionally driven. I feel, I think, I do, right? That goes, right? Controlled by sin, by natural circumstances, to be carnally minded is to be contrary to God's word. In fact, God's word is foolishness to the, contra- to the carnal mind, right? And it says, again, the carnal mind is enmity, and it's a very strong word, hatred to God. Spiritually minded, I am led by the Spirit of God. I have a craving for God. His purpose is His will, right? Don't we all want Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? I want to trust you, God, with all my heart. I want to lean not on my own understanding, but I, right? I want to look to you in all my ways, acknowledge you in all my ways, right? That is our heart. Spiritually minded, I'm looking to the Word of God. I know that it contains all things pertaining to life and godliness, right? I know that, I, that it has the answers for everything that I need, right? I know my thinking needs to be renewed, Romans chapter 12, right? It needs to be renewed under the word of God. To be spiritually minded is to understand garbage in, garbage out, right? So I am careful about what is coming in, and I know I need to do what Philippians 4, 8 says, that I I need to think on what is true and noble and just and pure and lovely and of good report and praiseworthy and what has virtue, right? To be spiritually minded, see if I can get this frog out of my throat. To be spiritually minded, I need the Lord. I know I need the Lord to bring victory to my thoughts, right? I know, right? Um, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds and casting down every argument and every high thing that exalts itself over God and that I am to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So as a Christian, he's saying you are spiritually minded. We're spiritually minded. We have Jesus in us, the Holy Spirit in us. But does that mean I can never think carnally? Unfortunately not. Can we lapse into carnal thinking? We can. But isn't the Lord faithful? He gives us first the soft. Oh, let us be sensitive to that first soft. And we just go, oh, sorry, Lord. Because you know what? We don't always, we're not always sensitive. And we go, 
And we get dug in and dug in. And then the Lord has to go, I'll turn up the heat. I'll turn up the, you know, I'll have to, you know, until we're getting a big old spiritual spanking, right, or whatever. But one nature or other will dominate. We can't be a little spiritual and a little carnal. and we, It just, right? One nature is going to dominate, dominate. And he says the carnal mind is death. Live on this physical plane. Think about pleasing me. Think in only regards to my feelings and circumstances. Let the world dictate my standards, right? Let culture dictate my thinking equals death. The spirit mind set my mind on things above like Colossians 1 or Colossians 3 says, trust God over my feelings. Let the word of Christ dwell in me richly. Abide in him, John 15. Listen to him, John 10. Life and peace. What's your choice? Right? Jesus came to give us life. And not just like a little dropper. Like, I'll give you a little life. Right? Life more abundant. Remember what it means. Not just abundant. Super abundant. It's like a big word. Right? It's abundant. And then peace. Peace meaning wholeness. Undisturbed quietness, rest. Do you want that? Or do you want chaos? Because again, in contrast, the carnal, carnal thinking always brings chaos. The carnal mind equals chaos. I love James 3 and what it talks about the wisdom that descends from above or the wisdom that descends from below because it really helps you filter out a lot of stuff and what you're thinking. In James 3, verse 4, it says, But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above. So it's not from God, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, listen to this, confusion and every evil thing. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, and then peaceable and gentle and willing to yield and full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. So we have the carnal mind and we have the spiritual mind. Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You are no longer debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. So chapter 6, we read over and over, we are dead to sin. We are to reckon our body dead to sin. He's saying you're not debtors to the flesh, meaning I owe the flesh nothing. Okay? I owe her nothing. She says, feed me. Feed me. Indulge me. Come on, indulge me. Right? She does. She does. She goes, oh, come on, for old time's sake. <laughs> Let's just watch this movie. And you're like, no, I can't. Come on. It feels so good. Just veg out, you know. Or let's just have, let's just engage in this unprofitable talk. A good, go we haven't had a good gossip session in so long. It'll be so good, you know, like a tasty trifle, the proverb says. Or let's just be mad at them. Come on. You can just be mad at them. Let's stew. Let's just stew for a while, right? The flesh. You know, do you know what I'm talking about, right? Isn't, she, you know her. Let's worry. Oh, come on. For old time's sake. Let's worry. We can trust God later. Let's just worry. Let's worry so good that we'll start freaking out. Let's just do it. Like, come on. Right? And you go, no, I owe you nothing. I, right? I owe you. I am to reckon you dead, old woman. Right? I am to put you to death. It means to mortify. It means like cold-blooded murder. She is a ball in a chain. She leads to death every time. So in my spirit, I say, am I going to choose you? Or am I going to choose life? I'll choose life. Thank you very much, right? Right? In this, I love this week, I, I thought so much about this carnal mind and how it, like, tries to just pop up. Um, when I was first saved, my, uh, Mike was still playing baseball, so he'd go on road trips, and I'd pick him up. And he always knew, he'd get in the car, and I'm driving. He's like, 
because he was like, so he got saved and he's like in the word like every second and he'd be like, yeah, uh, you haven't been in the word, huh? And I'm like, no, why? Why do you say that? Like, you know, but I'm, because immediately he knew when he got in the car with me, I'm like, you know, and this week, like, that's where I see it. Like, I'll be driving and I'm just like, you know, I have to like comment on everybody. And then I'm like, oh, carnal mind, carnal mind, shush, just shush. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for this guy, you know, right? I, I love like being just, Lord, like, thank you for letting me see this, this carnal mind that just wants to take control. But we can and we should have victory over the flesh because of Jesus, right? Because the Holy Spirit, it dwells in us, right? And that power that we have because of the Spirit. But do we still have this body of flesh? Have we been delivered from it? Yes, right? Who will deliver me from this body of flesh? Yes, we've been delivered. But is it gone? It's not gone. And so the question is, but am I living after the Spirit? Are you spiritually minded or carnally minded? And as a believer, I think we should all say, yes, I am living after the Spirit more and more. More and more I'm growing in this newness of life. I know I cannot please God in my flesh. I know I cannot be made perfect in the flesh, but I'm learning, I'm learning to lean upon the Spirit, to trust in the Spirit, right? Um, we were told that in Romans 6, reckon yourself to be dead to sin. Don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies present, I'm to present, right, three active commands, present my body, um, or my members, not to unrighteousness, but to righteousness, and so I want to make good choices, right, because Galatians 6 said, do not be deceived, my, uh, God is not mocked, for what a man sows, that he will reap, you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption, you sow to the spirit, you will reap life, right, and so what is strengthened in us is what we are sowing to, right? It's, an, uh, it's reaping and sowing our unalterable laws, right? A farmer will reap what he sows. You can't change that. And we will reap what we sow to. And so the nature of our Christian life is not to be characterized by self, is it? We are told by Jesus to deny ourselves. We are to follow this new law of, the, of Christ that's working in us, Right? And so as a believer, we can sow into one of two fields. We can make those choices of what we're sowing into. Am I sowing to my flesh or am I sowing to my spirit? And the fruit that we get is going to be dependent on where I chose to sow. And um, when we sow to the spirit, we stop letting our sinful nature control our minds. And we walk in step with the spirit. We live by the spirit. So verse 14 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. Mm. I'm going to, um, we're not going to really touch on the suffering part, because we get to look at that next week, because he'll go on in suffering, and it's good, it's good, but we're not going to touch on it, um, on that, that last verse, because it's, it's going to continue on into what we're looking at next week. But again, we have two spirits contrasted here. Again, like we've looked at, um, we've been looking at this contrast. And here is again another contrast. Spirit of bondage and spirit of adoption. And the spirit of adoption, again, is capital S spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Some translate similar to this. Like it's the spirit that makes you God's children. Something similar to that. So once we were slaves, sold under sin, we read that. Do you remember when we read we were under sin? We were in bondage to sin. We were slaves of sin. Now we are adopted children. Adoption. It's sonship or daughtership. It's, it's God wants to have a relationship with us as a loving father with his beloved sons and daughters. 
It's beautiful. In the Bible, there are many different names for God and, and beautiful names and beautiful descriptions of God, right? And the, but this might be the most precious, that he is called Abba, Father. Abba is an Aramaic word. It means father, it, but it ex, it's a sweet word. It expresses affection and confidence and trust. It signifies a close, intimate relationship. It's similar to our word daddy. And you know there's something special about daddy. You know, just like mom, mommy. You know when your kids are little and they're like, mommy, mommy. And then all of a sudden they're like, mom. And you're like, wait, 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 what? Where did I become mom? Right? It's just, it's just something so tender about mommy or mama. I had mom, one that always calls, so calls me mama. I'm like, don't stop. <laughs> but something so tender and sweet about daddy. And that's what this word, Abba, father is. Abba is always followed by the word father in scripture. And the phrase is found in three places. In Mark 14, 36, where Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. And he's praying and he says, Abba, father. Here in um, 8.15, and then in Galatians 4.6, where Paul is still talking kind of the same thing about adoption. And he says it's in our, our hearts, cry out, Abba, Father. And so many say, we're all children of God. You've heard that said. Every, we're all children of God. Jesus said it very differently, didn't he? Remember when he talked to the Pharisees? And he said, your father, because you don't hear me, your father is the devil. I mean, pretty strong. And so uh, Jesus had a different opinion on that. But um, this is a right that belongs to born-again believers. And a born-again believer has been made a child of God. And I loved when we sang it. It was so sweet to sing it this morning after studying it, right? Wasn't it even sweeter? I love that song. But then it was like singing it like, <gasps> right? We're adopted into the family of God, right? Redeemed from the curse of sin, made heirs of God, now we have this familia relationship, this family relationship. And think about it. You know what? That makes us, when we say, oh, sister, we are sisters. We are family, right? We are God's children, and that makes us family. It's really sweet. Look around. This is our family. Right? The family of God because we belong to God. So once I had the spirit of bondage and fear, and you think about that spirit of, spirit of bondage and fear. You think of Adam and Eve after the fall. Where were they? They, they were hiding. They were hiding from the Lord. They couldn't, they, they, they knew that that fellowship was broken. There was fear, right? But now it's different. I, I, I don't have that. I have the spirit of adoption, which means I can come running, crying, Abba, Father, Daddy. Like, that's the spirit I have. We've been given as children of God. You get it? It's so radically different. I've been, I, I don't have that spirit of fear and bondage. I have this spirit of adoption. God is my dad. And it is a source of hope and security to understand God is my father. Now, it is hard for some people that came it might be easier if you had a really good earthly dad. I had a really good earthly dad. Really good. He is in heaven. And, and it makes this easier to understand. But some people do struggle when they've had a really bad earthly dad to understand. But even the best earthly dad can't even come close, right, to how good our heavenly father is. And when Jesus taught us to pray, he said, pray like this, our Father, our Father in heaven. And consider how humbling that is, what he's seeing. He's saying the God of heaven, the creator, sustainer of everything, when you come to him, you call him Father, Dad, right? And we talked about how God loves us perfectly, right? And that should be like this settling thing, right? Because God demonstrated, Romans 5, his love for you while when you were a sinner, Christ died for you. Meaning God already loved you at your very, very worst. So if you're having a really fleshly bad day, God still loves you perfectly. He already loved you at your very, very, very worst, right? He can't love you any less. He loves us perfectly. And now we learn that where there's no condemnation, God is not mad at you. Ever. 
But we think that sometimes, right? That God's mad. God's mad. God's, God is not mad at you ever. Jesus already took all that punishment. You know what God is mad at? Sin. The consequences of sin. When we go our own way and there's going to be consequences, he's not mad at us. We're in Christ. There is no condemnation. God wants good things for us as a good dad, right? He wants good things. He wants to take care of us. He wants abundant life for us. The lie again is if I go, if I deny myself, there's nothing left for me, (laughs) right? My choice is better. I really think my choice is better. I really think doing it my way, God's way is too restrictive. It's called the Eve syndrome. Go back into the garden and remember her. Has everything God's like, I gave you everything. Just this one thing don't do because it's not going to be good for you. And they're like, and then where'd she go? Ah, I can't even touch the tree. Right? It's the Eve syndrome. Right? To, To know, forget, like God is such a good father. He wants good things for us. He wants to take care of us. He says, don't even worry. I'm going to take care of you. Just look to me. Just trust in me. Right? But that's that thinking, that's that carnal mind, and the carnal mind leads to death every time. You can't, you can't avoid it. But the spiritual mind is life and peace. And we are, he's saying, you are walking according to the Spirit, right? Because we are saved. We have the Holy Spirit in us. But Lord, help us to grow, to trust more in your Spirit to lean more on your spirit, and to be quicker to turn when I see that ugly flesh rise up. So we're going to pray and go to small group. Heavenly Father, um, I pray, God, that uh, you would bless our small group time. There's so many good things to talk about in this chapter, in these verses, Lord. So many things you've taught us, and you want us to um, strengthen each other in and encourage us, each other in. And so go before us into our small group time and bless it. We love you so much, Lord. God, help us to, to grasp, like, fully what um, you're teaching us. In Jesus' name, amen.